electricity. It's something that we are all very familiar with, and it's something that we rely on to underpin all of our lives. And for many people, that electricity is very expensive. And so what you can do with that electricity is limited by the cost of the power that you've got. But what would happen if that electricity became free? I'd like to introduce you to Mary. Mary is what I would call a new electricity consumer. Mary has a television in her house. She has electric light. She has a smartphone. And fairly soon, she's going to be looking forward to getting a fridge, maybe a bigger television, other appliances in her house. So when that conjures up a picture of Mary's house, on the outside of it, you might expect to see something a bit like this. A whole tangle of wires which is bringing power from a power station into a socket into Mary's house she's using to plug in her devices. But this is Mary's house. It's actually 10 kilometers from the nearest power station. It's not connected to the grid at all. But Mary still has access to electricity. She still has access to all of those sorts of devices that you might expect in your house. And the neat trick is that Mary doesn't have to pay for any of that electricity. Mary, in fact, is a technology pioneer. She doesn't know it, but she's actually a technology pioneer. And to understand why that is, it's kind of interesting to look at how electricity is conventionally generated. So when you or I think about electricity, we often think about something like this. This is a uh, coal-fired power station. So electricity is generally generated with a power station using fossil fuels. And that electricity is then transmitted very long distances over high voltage cables and it eventually ends up in a socket in your house and you go and plug devices into that. And this view of energy really hasn't changed for the last 100 years. But there are three big problems with this type of electricity. The first one, which is kind of topical at the moment, is climate change. Electricity generation is one of the main contributors of carbon dioxide and is seriously impacting climate in our planet. The second one is it's expensive. I don't know anybody that doesn't complain about their electricity bills. And the third one is that it's really not inclusive. So electricity across the mains works really well in cities. But when you get out to far-flung distances, the cost of connecting up a house to the grid becomes very high. In fact, it's possible that the cost becomes higher than the total lifetime amount of money that that consumer is going to spend on electricity. And what that means is that rural electricity is very often loss-making. So the only way that you're going to get somebody connected to that grid is if there is a government subsidy or some other mechanism of being able to connect up that consumer. But what if there was another way of being able to do that electricity? About 40 years ago, products like this were introduced onto the market. Now, the interesting bit about this photo is not the calculator. The interesting bit is that little power station, which is up on the top right-hand corner of that calculator. Within this calculator, there is a small solar panel. And that small solar panel providing just enough electricity to power the calculator and nothing else. And the great thing about that is that it doesn't have any dependencies on anything outside. It doesn't rely on having a socket in the house. It doesn't rely on having reliable electricity coming across the grid. So long as the sun comes out each day, and that tends to be pretty reliable, then this calculator is going to work. And that actually underpins a much more fundamental idea. 
So instead of having centralized generation of electricity, how about instead we have just enough electricity on each individual house to provide that energy that the household needs? That way, you don't need to have a grid because that energy is being delivered exactly where the household happens to be. Now, that turns out historically to be quite difficult. It's really hard to make a house-sized nuclear power station. It's really hard to go and make a house-sized wind turbine. But it actually turns out that it's really easy to make a house-sized solar panel. In fact, a solar panel that's the size of a little pocketbook is exactly as efficient as a solar panel that you'd find in a massive solar farm uh, around the world. So solar energy has the potential to be able to provide electricity at the household level, and it can be scaled out without the need for grid uh, wires or other connections. In effect, each house has its own little private power station. So if that's such a fantastic idea, how is it that the whole of Africa isn't covered by little power stations on their houses? Well, when you or I pay for electricity, what we do is we pay for what we use. But if you've got a power station on your house, you've got to buy that power station in the first place. And that power station costs money. So it's very difficult for people to be able to find the initial money to be able to pay for that power station. But about 10 years ago, a bunch of enterprising people put two and two together and said, well, hey, maybe what we can do is to combine technology in mobile phones, which is so prevalent all across Kenya and all across Africa, with the technology that you have as solar power. And what they did was to figure out a way in which you could put a small power station into somebody's house. But that power station wasn't turned on. In order to turn on that power station, people had to pay a small amount of money. And that would unlock that power station for perhaps a week or a month. And then at the end of that period, that power station gets locked again, and then the person pays another small amount of money, and so on. And the neat trick with that was that the cost of enabling that solar power was less than the cost of the kerosene and the mobile phone charging that it replaced. So on day one, the consumer was spending less money on clean, renewable solar energy than they'd been previously spending on conventional types of energy. And the second neat trick is that after about two years, the system is paid for and the user doesn't have to pay any more for their energy. So that householder now has access to energy which is free of charge, something that most of us would very much dream of wanting to be able to do. That process then leads to a journey, and that journey is to be able to have access to um, many different types of devices within the household. So when this sort of technology first came out, it was really very much about replacing a candle or a kerosene lamp. It was kind of a, a, a torch. And nobody suggested that that was a replacement for mains electricity. But technology moves really fast, particularly in this space. And today, people are able to get a 32-inch television with 60 channels of content that will run all day and all night, entirely powered by the sun. So when you've got that sort of a television, I don't think anybody would argue that that's not the same quality that you might reasonably expect to have in London or Nairobi or Johannesburg or anywhere else. So we've moved from a point where solar was sort of small technology to enable uh, very low-income households to where solar is genuinely replacing aspects of the grid. That television has a grid-like experience for the end consumer. And this technology is moving all the time. So in the next two or three years, it will be readily possible to get fridges, fans, and a whole range of consumer electronics 
on exactly this same affordable basis. And there's a whole industry which is providing technology that way. In fact, some recent industry studies suggest that roughly 10 million people have bought solar home systems on this basis and are now enjoying entirely free energy. And that rate of change is happening at such a rate that by the end of 2020, we expect another 10 million people to have managed to get access to that energy. In fact, here in Kenya, more people are getting energy from the first time from solar power than are getting people energy for the first time by getting a new connection on the grid. Solar power is no longer just a sort of a, a, an incidental part of the energy story, but actually is becoming a really important part of the broad energy mix right across Africa. And that's really important because in the world there are about a billion people who don't have access to electricity. In sub-Saharan Africa, there are about 600 million people who don't have access to electricity. And the population of sub-Saharan Africa is growing at such a rate that there are about 30 million people who need to be connected every single year. So today, technologies like solar are beginning to make a dent in that number of people who don't have access to energy. So what happens when energy becomes free? Well, some of you will be old enough to remember how transformational it was when the internet went from something that was expensive to something that was free. Instead of just using the internet for emails, we now use the internet to watch movies in the evening. You couldn't possibly have done that in the early days of the internet. And the same thing is true of energy. So now Mary is able to keep a light on on her house 24-7. She doesn't need a light 24-7, but hey, why not? It's not having any impact on climate change. It's not costing any money. So you might as well use the technology to its fullest. Similarly, kids are able to get access to technology at any time of day or night. Now, I'm not suggesting that every kid in rural Kenya has access to a laptop. But today, something like 60% of Kenyans have a smartphone. And you can see that the technology is coming. And there will be a day when kids have access to laptops routinely. And the cost of energy is not going to limit the amount of uh, usage that they can make of that. Similarly, people can have entertainment whenever they want. And you might say, well, what's the value of entertainment? It's fun, it's great, but does it really do any good? Well, some recent studies have shown that households that get a television in them increase their income by roughly 25% in the first year of getting a television. And that's because people get access to information about new ways of uh, uh, farming, of all sorts of other different ways of improving their lives. An example of that is this gentleman called Frank, who lives in Kitui in West Kenya. Frank is a motorcycle taxi owner, and he would spend roughly two-thirds of his day, as he is in this photograph, hanging around waiting for somebody to come along and give him a fare. But since Frank got solar power in his house, he's also got a smartphone. He can now have Uber for motorcycle taxis on his smartphone. So instead of waiting for people to come to him, he can go to other people in order to be able to get rides. Frank tells me that his income had gone up from 900 shillings a day, that's roughly $9 a day, to 2,400 shillings a day, $24 a day, in the space of six months, since he was able to use an internet-based mobile phone app on his smartphone. So an interesting question is, if you have energy, what are people's priorities in using that energy? This is a photograph in Nigeria where the grid is very intermittent and people use diesel generators in order to supplement the grid when it's not there. And diesel generators are expensive, so the things that people use are the things that people are going to find really valuable. And what we find is that a roughly half the energy use is for light, 
In Nigeria, about a third of it is for fans. That's because it's very hot in Nigeria. In other places, that might be a fridge or some other device. And nearly 10% is entertainment. Of those three things, all of those three things can readily be provided by solar power. There's only 3% that solar power can't affordably provide. And so that leads to a rather interesting vision of the world. In 25 years' time, my expectation is that uh, none of us are going to own cars. I also believe that anybody with a roof is going to have a solar panel in their house and they're going to have batteries. And what that does, it means that we're going to have choice. We're going to be able to get our energy from the free solar power in our house or the paid-for grid in the outside world. And guess what? People are going to do this. People are going to find ways of getting their equipment to work on the free energy rather than the paid-for energy that they otherwise would have had. So something that is starting in rural Kenya is actually becoming an underpinning of the way energy is going to go in the future. So let's go back to Mary and just look at her priorities. What are the things that drive her? Well, the first thing is safety and security. It's the ability to be able to have light at night. It's the ability to be able to get rid of kerosene lamps um, and make uh, life better for her children. The second thing is choice. By having electricity in the house, Mary has more flexibility at the timing of when she does things. She's not bound by the time that the sun goes up or the sun comes down. And the third thing is that Mary likes entertainment. But that entertainment also gives her information. And she's been watching a program called Shamba Shake Up in Kenya, which is teaching her how to improve her smallholder farming. And actually now she's able to sell some of those crops on the market. So Mary and her kids are joining the digital generation. They're enabled with energy to be able to get access to all of the modern services that you might reasonably expect to get in a, uh, in a city. But none of that requires wires. Mary is a technology. And in about 25 years' time, I suspect that many, many people in the world are going to be following Mary's lead. And all of that because of a little calculator that was invented about 40 years ago. Thank you.